Thank you so much, Pavlina, for taking time out to come speak with us. Um, so you, you couldn't have picked a more relevant time to release a book about employment. Um, probably, I don't know if you or I was on this call, I've seen, I, I saw a video the other day of in Kentucky, um, you know, a camera about a line miles long, people waiting um, to see an unemployment office. Um, I'm even hearing from friends now, you know, their companies that they work for are starting to open again but they're not hiring everyone back like, like is expected. You know, they're using this time to like downsize and do, try to do more with less. So this is a really important conversation for us to be having in this moment. So I'm really glad that we can be doing this. I have a question actually about your background. How did you left as an economist and what got you interested in, in specifically. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you, Paul, for moderating this. I just want to say, are you, is Paul freezing only for me or did he freeze for others? It looks like he's going out a little bit. <laughs> I, I think I heard, I got the gist of the, the question. Um, Thank you, thank you very much. Um, yes, I am not a naturally left economist. I think the left found me. <laughs> um, you know, you, uh, you may know I was born uh, in Bulgaria um, while it was still a socialist republic. So I was at the first opportunity seeking out the American dream uh, when, when uh, communism collapsed. And the only radio that I, I got to hear from the West was Deutsche Welle and Voice of America. So those were not exactly progressive outlets. Um, but so, no, I wasn't even planning on being an economist. I wanted to be in business, whatever that mean, meant. You know, I really didn't have an idea what that meant. Um, but I walked into an economics class, uh, which taught the history of thought, of economic thought, um, taught by Matthew Forstatter. And, um, and, and then very quickly, I realized that what I learned in Econ 100 had little to do with economic reality. And there are very many different thoughts out there. And once you're introduced to, to that kind of intellectual heritage, you start thinking critically, obviously, about the things that, uh, that you hear around you. And um, so that was, you know, Veblen, Marx, Schumpeter, Keynes was a big influence. I mean, all of that. Uh, made me question everything that I had learned in the conventional classes, which was very market centric and um, and then question even fundamental assumptions. So how I came to full employment really was as a macro, somebody interested in big picture, macro trends, macro policies, and the very idea that the economy on its own doesn't produce full employment. And that, that I got primarily from Keynes. Um, but once you start reading about unemployment, then you walk down a path that you can't come back. And you, you start, you know, I mean, I'm still interested, obviously, in the macro big picture questions, but you, you start understanding the political economy of unemployment, the micro, the human side of unemployment. And so while at the beginning, I was very interested in proposing kind of a technocratic solution to the problem of unemployment from the macro perspective, and that came from my work on MMT and understanding what the state can do uh, using its sovereign spending powers. Um, that eventually became a project that was um, obviously a human project that economists pretend it's not a human project, right? You know, we kind of de you know, depersonify the unemployed and we really don't humanize them unless we wanna kind of blame them for their own lot. So this was, you know, this was how uh, you know, I, I, so I think it was more finding the moral center, rather, right, of, of, of the work. Right. And I, I don't think many economists think about the moral center, if I'm being honest. Um, so that might be why you're, might be a little rare. Um, so before getting into your thoughts about how we should tackle unemployment, um, let's see what, how do traditional economists look at this? So you talk a lot about in your book, this myth of the natural rate of unemployment. So can you go into how did this concept even start? What, what are its roots? And why do you think this um, concept is so wrong and off base? And I hope, did I freeze that time? Oh. No, no, you didn't. Okay. Yeah, uh, so this is really a very important uh, 
development in economics. Economics teaches us that the market clears, the market will produce full employment. That is what every student gets in Econ 100. And as long as prices and wages are flexible. But of course, we see the reality and we see that unemployment is still with us. So economists have this concept that there is some natural level of unemployment that will be consistent with a good economy, well-functioning economy. And that concept of the natural unemployment has evolved. But I, I think it is so deeply ingrained, both in theory, but also in the minds of the lay person. You know, even if you ask somebody, what do you think about unemployment? You know, can we create jobs for everybody? Probably most people say no, you know, and this is, this is just what happens, right? This is just what happens in a market economy. Now, from a theoretical point of view, um, after World War II, when we understood the, uh, the ravages of unemployment and that we had to commit to some sort of full employment agenda, even policymakers, even the Fed wouldn't talk about, very few economists would talk about the natural rate of unemployment in earnest. There were a few, Hayek, Friedman, you know, they will insist that, it, that unemployment somehow was good for the economy, but it took another you know, decade or so for, for the arrival of this other concept called the Nairu, or the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, um, mouthful that basically says, there is some golden level of joblessness that is consistent with price stability. And God forbid we go below that level, right? Because if, if we actually breach that natural level, then we will get inflation. Well, how would that happen? You know, the idea behind this is that, you know, workers might ask for wage demands. They might ask for higher wages. And then employers might have to increase their prices to cover those costs. And so you see, it is in the toolkit, the theoretical toolkit, that unemployment is there as a bulwark against inflation. And that has become a policy guide for economic policy. In other words, when, when economists think that, that the Nairu has gotten too low, unemployment has gotten too low, then they consider that it's time to step on the brakes and slow down economic growth so that we don't get further decreases in unemployment, else we'll get inflation. So that, uh, that entire uh, framework is um, empirically dubious, number one. If you've been watching the conversations over the last few months, you will see that even the Fed begrudgingly has admitted that they don't know what this Nairo level is. Um, and so, and they have also admitted they don't quite fully understand the, the, the inflationary mechanisms. So if you don't know what the Nairo is, if you don't know exactly what causes inflation, then there is no economic macroeconomic justification to insist on positive level of unemployment for, for economic stability. So that is kind of the macro question I wanted to really drill into and, uh, and, and, and sort of challenge um, as, as one that needs to be removed from the economic policy toolkit. Because if you notice, we don't do the same for other economic problems. Like if we say uh, there's natural rate of uh, homelessness, right? We don't, we don't talk about this. We don't argue for policy purposes that we need to keep 5% of people in without shelter, right? You know, we still haven't resolved the problem of homelessness, no doubt, but it's not a intellectual kind of commitment to some sort of uh, positive level of, of, um, of homelessness and unemployment. So I think that's really the history of, of, the, of the profession. And uh, there is not really any more to me theoretical justification in holding on to this. It is a political justification, which means that when we experience mass unemployment, episodes of mass unemployment, and when policy has not been able to reduce the unemployment rate to desired levels, then economists say, well, it was a permanent shock. The Nairo has increased permanently. It's just a justification for policy failure. And so it has to go for that reason as well. Right. And you have this amazing quote in the book from, I think it was the Federal Reserve Chairman saying, you know, we have to make sure unemployment is just right. And so if 10 million people are unemployed, we're supposed to be happy that it's just right, which really just shows how absurd this whole notion is. Um, 
And so you call the job guarantee the missing piece of the Roosevelt Revolution or the missing piece of the New Deal. And I think that's a really good way to put it. Um, so can you go through some of the historical examples of jobs programs in the United States and attempts at creating something like full employment and not even just a New Deal, but even if I think there were some initiatives in the 70s and 80s that really didn't catch on. Can you kind of just give a brief overview of what, you know, the heights of our attempts at creating full employment? Yeah, if I can just contextualize uh, the job creation yeah. experience, because a lot of folks think of the job guarantee as a very radical kind of policy. And there's ma there are many reasons which I think it's really not that radical proposition. But um, just imagine what we did in the 30s, just in, in, in a few short years, uh, when we passed minimum wages, when we passed the limits on the working uh, day and week, working week, when we passed social security, when we passed unemployment insurance. I mean, talk about radical transformation. I think the scale uh, uh, of the ambition for today needs to match that. And the job guarantee is, is a missing piece because, um, you know, uh, FDR articulated economic rights. You know, he believed that economic insecurity must be eradicated once and for all, not just in the midst of the Great Depression, but permanently. And, you know, he put a, a blueprint of what those economic rights should be. And the, the leading one was the right to a remunerative job. Also education, the right to education, to housing, to medical care, um, food, etc. So we have made some attempts to uh, provide safety nets in these other areas, but we haven't really made an attempt to do that for jobs. In other words, our welfare safety net is, is still, still rather weak, but at least there is some thinking about if somebody has retirement insecurity, the goal should be to guarantee retirement income, right? If there is somebody who uh, lacks education, the goal should be to guarantee education. But we don't do that for healthcare, we don't do that for, um, for jobs. Um, even housing policy has gotten terrible over the years, but at least the idea initially was if somebody lacks housing, we guarantee for public housing. Um, with jobs, we don't have a guarantee. What we do is we say, if you have um, unemployment, we guarantee unemployment insurance, um, temporary, not to everyone, as we know, it covers very, you know, not even half of the people eligible, and and um, and it's too low. But it's it's one type of security. It's not the job security that um, FDR outlined in that recipe. So, okay, so that was the context. Um, but then the experience. What has been the experience? We have had um, attempts to do direct employment, to guarantee employment in the US and abroad. I think it's useful analytically to separate how we have gone about this. So for the most part, we, we, deal, we do direct employment programs as a crisis response tool. And I think that that's what is going to happen now too. You know, uh, little by little, people will discover the direct employment solution to the COVID crisis. So that was the WPA, that were, that those were the programs from the New Deal to provide, provide employment relief. Uh, uh, there was a similar very large scale program uh, in Argentina in the early 2000s that was also done as employment relief in the midst of a crisis, and I can talk more about that. But then there are different kinds of policies that are structural but they're not permanent. So the 70s programs that you mentioned, the CETA, for example, they attempt to do, um, you know, to, to provide employment in the sense of making the unemployed more employable, so to speak, and help them transition to private sector employment. So there is, there is that some structural angle, but those were limited programs that guaranteed employment opportunities for a very short period of time. There was a, another program in the late 70s that was the youth entitlement program that was very, very good. It was not permanent, but it had a really good impact um, on especially black youth. And it closed all the different in terms of employment, in terms of wages, and it, it just showed that the problem was discrimination and lack of jobs, not 
all of the other arguments that we were told. So, so we've had experiences with these kinds of structural uh, programs. And there's only one a program around in, in the world that is a permanent, that is codified as a legally enforceable right to employment, and that is in India. Uh, but that is only rural employment, and again, it's um, not, um, it, it's 100 days of work. But it is a permanent infrastructure that uh, provides employment when needed at all times, in good or bad. I just recently um, read an article, and I think I tweeted it, about the impact that this program has had in the midst of COVID. It has been probably the only kind of safety net that a lot of people have been able to um, rely on as they've lost their urban jobs and moved back home into rural areas. So that would be the, the kind of landscape of job creation programs. And then there are smaller programs that, you know, we can look to for, you know, for lessons. Uh, be devil's advocate, wh why do we need a federal job guarantee? Why can't uh, we incentivize Oh, it looks like you're cutting out again. Probably comes back to life. Why do we need the federal government? Why should it be the federal government and I'm not sorry, the private sector that uh, can produce full employment? Okay. Yeah. I mean, okay. So there are. There right. are sorry, I'm cutting out again. Yeah. Um, all right. So there are several reasons. The first one is a macroeconomic reason. We we understand that the private sector on its own just doesn't produce jobs for all. And so that the job guarantee is really a commitment to providing job opportunities to anyone who wants one. Um, the private mechanism for many theoretical and other reasons we can go into just doesn't create enough employment opportunities, not the least because of the profit motive. And there may be a circumstance where conditions you know, kind of align themselves where we have very low unemployment level, but that is not something, that's not a condition that endures, that sustains, and the market on its own can't, cannot, uh, cannot guarantee it. The other thing is that private firms don't like to hire the unemployed. I mean, this is the paradox of our economy. If we, want to, we want to solve the unemployment problem, but firms do not want to hire the unemployed. And economists call this hysteresis when people then are trapped in long-term unemployment and then there are scarring effects and firms then see them as unemployable. And then they will, what they will do is firms will change the rules of the game. As the economy becomes stronger and stronger and they hire people, they actually change the hiring criteria. They, they make them tougher. And so people who are having the hardest time getting into the labor market and getting you know jobs they actually are now faced with higher barriers uh because uh firms you know would hire somebody with a short gap in their resume and then you know much later they will hire somebody who's been out of work for a very long time so for example you know stay-at-home mothers experience much higher barriers to re-employment than unemployed unemployed mothers Okay, so if you've had a job and you've lost a job, you have better chances of being employed than if you have been a stay-at-home parent for a very long period of time. Um, you know, people with disabilities, they've had their employment rates recover the last in, in the, um, after the Great Recession. So, so people who are most vulnerable and have the greatest obstacles to employment are caught in this vicious cycle and the private sector can never really mop up. Uh, not to mention the private sector also, you know, finds other criteria to discriminate uh, about uh, again, uh, uh, against people. And so folks are catch, uh, caught in a catch-22 scenario where uh, unemployment itself becomes the obstacle to reemployment. And they also tend to suffer a lot of other social costs. We can talk about that later. That also, let, you know, also uh, um, uh, causes a, a loss of contact, loss of connections, loss of all of the other channels to re-employment. Um, and so I think that, you know, it is, it is um, the narrative of blaming unemployment on the unemployed is this very myopic, you know, micro narrative of looking at one person without looking at from the bird's eye view at, of, uh, of the economy as a whole. So the unemployed are the charge of the public sector. 
the public sector is already responsible for unemployment. And as I was saying a moment ago, the government kind of picks the unemployment rate. You know, whenever they decide that the economy is just, the, the unemployment rate is just right, uh, and then they withdraw stimulus from the economy, in a sense, the government is chosen the unemployment rate. And then the government has to provide the income assistance and then address all of the other fallout from unemployment. So it is incumbent on the public sector to actually uh, uh, address the problem of unemployment. And they are missing this one piece, the direct employment tool. Well said. Um, I have Tyler ready to read questions if I keep freezing too much. Um, I think my internet might be messing up again. But um, let's get into what you actually propose in the book. So let's say the job guarantee was passed tomorrow. What would this actually look like? And what kind of jobs could people actually get through these federal jobs? I mean, because it is a public program, um, it, the proposal is that employment is in the public service. For the same reasons that the private sector doesn't create employment opportunities for everyone who needs them, and th that is the reason why we have neglected the public sphere and the public good. Because what makes for a good life is, a lot of what makes it for a good life is not for commercial return. So, you know, we see our neglected communities, we see environmental problems, we see um, so much work that is not being done because it's just not profitable. And so if the public sector um, is then dealing also with that public squalor, the jobs should be in public service that enhance the public good and, um, uh, and then they can be structured around what I would call the economics of care. So public service employment opportunities in environmental projects, in care projects, in community renewal projects. What would it look like? Um, in every county in the United States, we have unemployment offices and they are called American job centers and they provide all sorts of assistance except for jobs. And so the proposal is to convert them into genuine employment offices. You can go into the unemployment office, get unemployment insurance, get help with the resume, get trained for an interview for a job that isn't there. Now, what if we had a mechanism by which these become the jobs banks and we solicit proposals from the bottom up, from the community, for the kind of work that the community needs to get done? And they, these are, um, uh, they are then listed in the unemployment offices for folks who are coming and looking for work. Now, it is a federally funded program for a number of reasons. Um, a guarantee can really only be guaranteed by the federal government as a genuine guarantee, but they're locally administered. And so um, they could be a, a different mechanism for implementation, but municipalities, localities, local uh, groups uh, can propose projects for um, environmental care, as I said, renewal for um, addressing the needs of the elderly, of young um, children after school activities, clean up, I mean, you name it, you, you know. So, so it's really a, a, public, a public service program that, um, that is managed from the ground up. Great, and you, you, uh, you cite a simulation, like a study, about what the effects of a job guarantee really would be on inflation and GDP. Can you kind of summarize what that simulation found? Like, would this actually lead to higher inflation? No, not at all. So we did a simulation with colleagues at the Levy Economics Institute. I'm just gonna give you that, the high scenario because we did those um, more than a year ago uh, when unemployment was pretty low. And we wanted at the time to, uh, to model the most ambitious uh, program. So we, we were doing that when unemployment was very low and we still said, what if we employed 15 million people in this jobs program? Since we're so close to full employment, will that create inflationary effect? So what we found, and we used a pretty standard, um, by standard I mean well-performing macroeconomic model because you can't trust all standard, all standard models. Um, so what we found is that you know, if we were to hire 15.4 million people, um, then 
the um, GDP will increase by almost $600 billion. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a considerable chunk, uh, a bump up in the permanent growth rate. Then we found that um, private sector employment increases permanently up between three and four million jobs. And the inflation, well, let me just say, uh, state budgets improved by 55 billion. This, this is to be expected. States are so, so much responsible for dealing with, with all the problems of unemployment. So state budgets improve. Um, the overall expenditure on this program is 1.3% uh, of GDP. 1.3% is not very much, um, but we do not account for all the savings that this program could cause. You know, there, there are a lot of expenditures that are a little difficult to measure that are associated, for example, with people being sicker as a consequence of unemployment and the, you know, the public sector expending resources for people who are, um, who, who are sicker or children who underperform in schools. And so they will be some social positive social multipliers and they're not fully accounted for. So um, the inflation effect is 0.09%. So it, it, it's negligible. And, and the reason is because this is really a, a from the bottom up policy. It is, it is one that uh, increases, uh, increases um, employment, but also increases output, increases demand, and increases supply. Um, so I'll get to every, every left wing economist's favorite question. Um, how would we pay for this? Um, you do hint at in the book and I'm turning my video off to hopefully minimize the choppiness on the audio, but um, you hint at your, in your book about modern monetary theory. So how do you envision paying for this? Would this be a combination of, you know, taxing the rich at a higher rate as, as well as other sources? So, you know, what is the vision for paying for this? Okay, well, I mean, how to pay for is, is not, long, not anymore a question. You know, as I think everybody's realizing, how to pay for is an objection. So whenever you hear how to pay for, you have to just say no. <laughs> you do not answer the question. I, of course, I will answer the question, but that question is never asked of any other program except programs that address the, you know, uh, the needs um, of, uh, of the poor, the unemployed, of children, and etc. So. Um, we pay, it's a federally funded program, so we pay for it by public money, right? Government has all the financial resources and government has an, a technically, in a technical sense, unlimited spending power. And when it wishes to employ the public purse, it has no problem paying the bills and the checks do not bounce. So that's what we mean by monetary sovereignty, that the treasury Congress authorizes some spending and the Treasury and the Fed coordinate to make sure that all bills are paid. And that's the unique privilege of the government sector um, that we independently do not have or states do not have because you know, they are, uh, they're not monetarily sovereign. They don't have these institutions, these funding institutions. So, so we pay for it the way we pay for any other program. We pay for it the way we pay for COVID, for wars, for financial crisis. And, and what I want to highlight here is that we are always paying for it. We are absolutely always paying for unemployment. We are absolutely always paying for the costs of unemployment. So it's not like we are increasing government spending. We are actually reducing spending on neglect and all the negatives that, that come from unemployment. So I think that that's the proper comparison. I gave you some budget impacts. It's possible that the program could be even budget neutral, uh, budget neutral. Uh, that will not be a criteria for success because this is a permanent program. When you have COVID, the government expenditure necessarily has to increase to pay for as many jobs as, as necessary to recover from a COVID-like crisis. And then when the economy recovers, then um, expenditure shrinks. So it's important to understand this, this, this aspect of public spending that it is always counter-cyclical it's just that in this case, the proposal is that we do this by supporting good employment, 
and community renewal and the public purpose. Well said, and it's amazing, you know, we just went through this democratic primary where every debate, they're asking how you pay for Medicare for all, and then all of a sudden, $2.2 trillion, just like that, to deal with economic stimulus. So I think a lot of Americans are seeing that, you know, you can really pay for anything anytime you want when, when there's a will to do it. And I think that's been a big lesson people are seeing playing out in real time. Um, yeah, can I just give you one example? Yeah. Um, the, the CARES Act, which you know, was passed overnight, uh, was large enough to pay everybody's wage in the entire economy for three months, plus a job guarantee for all of the unemployed. This was how large the budget was. And uh, you know, most people understand that a lot of money was spent, but they might not have the scale of the expenditure. And mm -hmm. it was, um, you know, a crisis kind of concentrates the mind. And I hope that you know, I was hoping that 2008 will illustrate how uh, when we want to do something, we are able to do it literally overnight. I hope this moment also illustrates it so that we don't entertain any more these ideas of the government not being able to pay for what's right. Right, definitely. Um, and just a reminder to people to be putting your questions in the chat. At the end, we're going to collect them and um, read them for to be answered. Um, so... You mentioned that you know the job guarantee it can be funded federally and administered locally, um, and you know this opens up opportunities for democratic forms of government um, governance and planning. So you could have unions, local organizations planning projects and um, planning jobs. Um, so for me, thinking about this, there's one potential red flag raised in here, and um, I think there's been a, a big problem in this country is that we've had nonprofits and NGOs doing what really a functional welfare state should be trying to do or trying to do what a welfare state would be doing. And I'm sure, as you know, many of our nonprofits and NGOs, they are backed by donors that are actually have interests opposed to social democratic policy aims. So do you have any kind of concern that at the local level, a jobs guarantee could kind of be taken over by NGOs and nonprofits that are really, um, they don't share the same interests that we do? I mean, Yes. Uh, I mean, this is a job guarantee, right? It's not just for progressives, right? It is for everybody. Um, so there are concerns, but here, here's how I think about uh, the issue. The first is that we have gutted the public sector for many, many years. And that's why the task seems taller. So my preference, of course, would be to strengthen the public sector, to strengthen um, public agencies um, that are supposed to do, um, you know, all the important ongoing work. I'd like a well-staffed CDC with experts, a FDA that is able to inspect all drug and food that is necessary, right? So, so we have uh, just a neglected public sector in general. Now, should we run the job guarantee through a federal agency? I mean, ultimately, the buck stops with the federal government because it is a safety net uh, and because the government has the power of procurement right it it's there still is an important role for the federal government to play in establishing some of the parameters so but what i um i think is useful is this horses for courses kind of approach where you would have some uh projects that might be federal you will have some that are local and you know by municipalities organized but you also want to empower the communities to be able to maybe sidestep toxic local politics and propose projects that will be that are that are good. You know that you know you might be organizing a community theater, you might be organizing you know various other green projects, um, and and they may be some sort of you know you, you know they may be a difficulty. Um, you know the concern with nonprofits I share. But, you know, you could have a Trump using the job guarantee that builds the wall, right? That, that doesn't make the program undesirable. It is what, what that means is that we, we need to have a strategy to make it robust. What experiences with these bottom up, these participatory models of community organizations show is that you, you, you actually create a lot of community buy-in you, um, you know, people have a stake in the success in these programs. 
they are better run I, uh, and, and they, they allow people to self-determine. So I think a mix of federal, local and community uh, job creation is probably what, what would be good for the kind of the resilience. But it will not be immune to problems, I'm no, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, and, I um, use the example of education, you know, I mean, education is a state, it's a state, you know, it's a, it's a, it's state run and it's poorly run. And, you know, there's a constant battle of, you know, should we have charter schools, you know, underfunding, but, um, you know, I, you know, what is going to be the administration, but it is accepted as a, as a right, right? We, we believe that that has to be guaranteed and we put in an infrastructure there and we, fight for it and we defend it. It's not immune to pop, you know, to problems, but it is, it is kind of a permanent feature of what we're attempting, attempting to do. Um, so I do a lot of my political work in the uh, trade union movement. And one thing that's always attracted me about full employment is that it would put workers across the board, whether you're in a union or not, in a stronger position of leverage. Um, can you break down for people why this is the case, why full employment would um, increase workers' power? Yeah, I mean, unemployment structures almost every aspect of the labor market. It is, you know, we, for example, we look with nostalgia to the post-war model of the social contract when corporations were creating good union jobs and there was low level of unemployment but you know what it wasn't eradicated and unemployment looms over every negotiation unemployment is the reason why we tolerate harassing employers you know unemployment is 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 the reason why you know uh, why there's wage theft because it's it's a, it's a game of musical chairs. It's a cruel game of musical chairs. And so if we put in place a, a, a system that guarantees decent employment to anyone, then things change, especially for those at the bottom who experience the most of these uh, problems with precarious work, right? You, you can actually quit uh, that job and you know, not tolerate unemployment, uh, uh, not tolerate uh, harassment or wage theft, et cetera. And folks who are working in low wage jobs are the ones that have the least bargaining power. And so in that, in that sense, we firm up, um, you know, distress no longer becomes the, the defining factor for our decision-making, right? Who's going to work? How long will they work? even the bargaining within the family, it becomes different, you know, uh, is one person going to be the caretaker and the other one is going to take a job? Who will take another part-time job to supplement the family income? Distress does not define these choices because you know that there is going to be at least a, a decent living wage job around the corner. And, and as I said, you know, this, this constant churning in the labor market, I mean, the U.S. unemployment rate is very volatile. You know, I call it a yo-yo effect in the book. And, you know, what that is, is, is a very disposable, you know, this is a model of disposable people, right? Overnight, we lay off millions. And then we take such a long time to recover the unemployment rate, such a long time to recover payrolls. That is a kind of model that, you know, thinks of, of workers as obviously as disposable. Now, if you have a safety net like this, First, you guarantee the minimum wage floor because it doesn't matter what kind of laws you have, minimum wage laws you have. If you cannot secure a minimum wage job, your wage is zero, right? Um, so first, we secure that. Second, if, if that is also accompanied with a wage benefit package, it exerts pressure on companies to match that. You might leave that uh, private sector job if you have Medicare uh, that is provided through the job guarantee and childcare and paid leave. So there is, a, there is a bubble up effect where private sector has to match some of these conditions. Now, we know that you know, these, the private sector can match these conditions. You know, they will kick and scream, but you know, Amazon was shamed last year into raising their wages to $15 an hour, and they did it overnight. So 
you know, we will hear, I think, the, the, you know, lots of objections to the detrimental effect this might have on the private sector, but we are hoping to um, really drive a stake at that precarious in, an employ, employment um, situation for folks at the bottom. Like we want to, um, we, we, you know, the, it, it's a feature of the program to make sure that um, people don't have the privilege of paying poverty wages, right? That's what unemployment is. The defense of unemployment is the defense to allow companies to pay poverty wages. Yeah, and if, if Jeff Bezos is on his way to being the first trillionaire, I have a hard time believing Amazon can't pay living wages. Um, but, and I gotta say that, you know, it, it does worry me post COVID, if we're gonna be sitting at 10% unemployment, the kind of desperation workers will be feeling, and it's gonna be, you know, a hard climate in terms of organized labor to really start raising standards with a high unemployment rate. Um, so that's a really important point. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Green New Deal. Um, this job guarantee is a, a very important component of the Green New Deal, and you really emphasize in your book a lot of the work that we could be doing is um, environmental kinds of work. Um, but you make an, an important distinction between two types of job, job guarantees within the Green New Deal. Can you explain um, the two different types of job guarantees? Yes. So. Um the way to understand the two guarantees is to understand how the job guarantee is different from the Green New Deal. The job guarantee is a uh, employment safety net and it's there at all times that firms up the minimum wage benefit uh, floor we'd like to secure for the economy as a whole. The Green New Deal is an industrial strategy, right? That's a plan for transformation. And a lot of the green movements were not terribly successful because they were not able to articulate how they will deal with the displacement effect, right? Uh, the job displacement effect. If you lose your fossil fuel job, you know, are you sure that you will get one in the green economy? That's what the job guarantee does. That is that, that safety net and that, that promise that they will, be, they will be something that ensures a transition. But the Green New Deal, because it's an industrial strategy, it actually has three guarantees. The first one is that we will need all manner of work, skill and experience to put in place the industrial strategy. So those will be highly paid, unionized jobs. It will be some sort of a combination of private and public investment. Um, as I said, all manner of expertise and skill. So it's a guarantee that these will be good jobs in the industrial plan. There's a second guarantee where um, people who have, who have suffered the health consequences, for example, of the fossil fuel, the extractive economy, miners, right? um, they will be guaranteed the option of early retirement. So there is actually an income guarantee there for them of early retirement with commensurate pay. Um, and then the third guarantee is the safety net, which is the job guarantee. And, I propose in the book that they are actually two separate pieces of legislation because if the Green New Deal is implemented and it is successful in transforming the economy and accomplishes what it aims to do, stabilizes emissions, right, and temperatures, then should we retire the job guarantee? does it mean that we're not going to need the job guarantee? And the argument is that so long as we still have an economy that goes through cyclical fluctuations, then um, as long as that economy still has cyclical fluctuations, then we will still need to have an employment safety net. So um, the example would be, let's say, the, the economy as it emerged from World War II. Right? There was mass mobilization, we electrified the nation, we did the interstate highway system, we actually had industrial policy. Um, but, and that created some good jobs, but that didn't have the job guarantee. So it gave us a couple of decades of prosperity and then, uh, and then uh, you know, unemployment kind of took hold. And in fact, if you look at it, uh, the share of long-term unemployment in total unemployment starts growing in the early 60s. 
So, you know, more and more people end up being, if they're unemployed, they end up being in long-term unemployment, which means that unemployment is this intractable problem that feeds on itself and we just have to find a way to, to, to tackle it. Very, very important point. Um, so I was talking to my friend in my union the other day um, about this event. She unfortunately couldn't make it on, but she's very interested to read the book. And the first thing she responded was, um, what about small businesses? Is this job guarantee going to sink many small businesses? So what would you say to someone who's worried about what this is going to do to these small businesses? Look, I think once again, if it's a small business that doesn't pay good wages to its workers, that's a problem, right? Do we, like, is that defensible? Like, do we want to have anyone working for poverty wages? Now, as I was listing a moment ago, um, the impacts um, on the economy, they're positive, but think of it from the point of view of the small business. If, um, if right now you have a mom and pop shop in a community that has 10% you know, unemployment, is that better for you than if you had a job guarantee program where people will actually be able to get jobs and they'll be able to come into the shop uh, with more stable incomes and purchasing power? Yes, you might need to raise your wages, but you know you have a steady stream of customers and businesses, you know your community is thriving. And so there are you know, positive, positive effects. So I, I, I tend to think that this is a bit of a red herring, the small businesses, um, because the anxiety is natural. I, I completely can appreciate the anxiety, but it's often used as kind of as, a, as, a, as an excuse not to uh, encourage firms to pay good wages to their workers. Yeah, it's, and it's amazing in America, the psychological attachment to small businesses that many people have, um, even if they admit, you know, some of the negative effects of low wages. Um, but uh, I think that's a really good response to people. Um, so let's turn to, uh, so universal basic income has become uh, much more popular than it was just a year or two ago. I don't think we have any Yang Gang people on this call possibly, but Andrew Yang has made this um, much more pop popular in our discourse. Um, can you explain why UBI without a job guarantee um, is still not sufficient for addressing the problem? I know you're not against UBI, but you're saying without a job guarantee, it's gonna to be too limited. Can you explain that? Well, I think the first thing I should say is that um, it really depends what we mean when we say UBI. You know, if we mean, you know, send everybody a check of $500, okay, what is that going to do? Like send everybody $1,000, it's going to help, surely, right? But um, it's, you know, that's not what we are really talking about. I think, you know, UBI is in its ideal state is the, is the level of income that would be adequate for a person to quit their job, right? That's, you know, so that's, so I'm, 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 I'm happy to go on record and say that I'm opposed to a UBI that is, let's say $35,000 uh, per person that is given to everyone rich or poor, irrespective of the phase of the business cycle at all times, right, as a permanent feature like that, that is a proposal that I disagree with on many, many different levels. Um, it's not counter cyclical, it's not stabilizing the way the job guarantee or any other fiscal policy is. Um, it actually might exacerbate inequality, you know, if, if, you know, if Donald Trump is able to put the $35,000 in their retirement portfolio, what is going to happen to other people, you know, they'll consume it, pay, pay their debt, their student debt, right? It's not exactly empowering and structure shattering, right? It doesn't change the power relationships in and of itself. And there is the argument that UBI can allow you to opt out of bad jobs. And I'm very sympathetic to this argument, but the issue is, can you opt into a good job? And only the job guarantee can ensure that. So I, I feel that we have a lot of commonalities with, with the UBI camp where we find that the precarity is our big concern of jobs. And we do not want people to stay in abusive, uh, you know, with abusive employers, for example. But, um, but what we know is even from the UBI experiments that people, even when they, they fare better with the cash assistance, they still need employment and it, they still face a market that doesn't guarantee employment. And there are many other reasons. I mean, you know, 
when, when you look at the social cost of unemployment and you look at poverty, income is just one aspect of poverty. If you still have a slum lord that is raising your rent uh, because they know you now get your UBI, it hasn't really empowered you. But if you have a, a project that can help rehabilitate public housing and also creates you know, uh, various other public services in the city, it kind of, at least the job guarantee is designed to um, alleviate some of the pressures that people are experiencing, not just by getting income, but also doing the sorts of things that they need in their communities. And, and finally, I wanna say that where we merge is the bottom up uh, design of the job guarantee because it's participatory design. You know, a lot of po people from the UBI camp say, you know, just give me my money and let me self-determine and let me do what I want. Well, here's the proposal. The job guarantee actually allows you to, to come together within the community and be an artist, right? Do, as I said, you know, after school activities for children, for, for adults, um, community gardens. I mean, we really can expand sort of the definition of what is good, useful work that's been neglected and not remunerated. So, so I feel that, that we are talking past each other with the UBI. I, you know, from, as a macroeconomist, that kind of universal, very generous UBI, I disagree with. But there are so many points at which we can share, uh, you know, find an understanding of how to create good employment. And also, I will be the first to say we don't want 100% employment. Right? We don't want everybody working. We want to support people who um, cannot work for one reason or another, but that is a different program, right? The job guarantee just deals with the absence of decent work. I'm just gonna go in order here. This is the next question, so I, had, I didn't select this one, but um, one thing that's uh, really been concerning me or concerning Paul, I guess, lately are the, the culture wars. Um, it seems like whenever we start making progress and uniting people around shared interests, the, the right wing and sometimes, frankly, the left wing starts dividing people on cultural issues. Um, and they can make anything into a culture war, even wearing a mask. So now, a Hill Harris ex poll from October uh, 2019 shows that 78% of voters supported the job guarantee, including 71% of Republicans, 87% of Democrats, and 81% of independents. From a strategic point of view, this feels like the type of program the left should focus on to really build a coalition around. So can you talk about this? Um, well, um, I think, I mean, jobs really shouldn't be a partisan issue. I'm sure they can be made a partisan issue, but um, when you pull the job guarantee against other uh, government programs, this one seems to beat them consistently and gets a lot of support. And now we, it, the job guarantee has been in the public um, discourse for you know, a couple of years. And even, even people who are not familiar with the program, they, they seem sympathetic. There are other surveys from, that's, that, you know, from the 80s that still show more than 50% support. So I think, I think it's because employment is such an important aspect of our life. And it's not just the American ethos of, of work. This has been polled in other countries as well. Even in the UK, a, a recent poll showed 71% support. So, uh, you know, jobs are popular. Now we have not coalesced around uh, jobs. And I think that, I think it's, it's important for us to start organizing around this idea because the idea is out there for the taking, right? It's, you know, uh, anyone can implement a direct employment program. You know, the question is, what will we do? As I was saying a moment ago, are we gonna be building walls or are we going to be um, in improving communities in our lives? And I think that especially in the midst of crisis, as, as we were talking, you know, discussing, um, people, the idea is being mainstreamed quite quickly. Now, maybe it's not exactly mainstreamed the way I talk about it as a permanent, permanent feature, but the idea that the government should directly employ the unemployed, it's being mainstreamed very, very quickly. And we could end up with one of those one-off emergency um, kind of uh, policy measures that will have you know, here and there, some infrastructure projects, some other direct employment programs, and it might help us emerge out of this crisis. 
But if it's not permanent, it's not going to create jobs for all. And we're going to settle at some sort of positive level of unemployment again, you know, reproducing this, you know, this groundhog day, you know, cycle. Um, and so, so I think it, it's important that, you know, we are re-envisioning what that direct employment should be and how it can become a feature of the policy toolkit the way we once committed to social security, you know, to minimum wages and, uh, you know, think bigger and bolder. And I think that, again, it's, it's not uh, immune to political wrangling, but none of these policies were immune, right? to the, the political haggling. And I think that the fact that it resonates with people and that you know, providing somebody with an employment opportunity is, is popular. So the question is who is going to do it? Is it, is it going to be a, you know, an Orban or Trump type of uh, you know, policymaker or is it going to be uh, someone else? I'm back on, Pavlina. Very sorry about that. Um, but I, I, and I caught your last point, and I mean, some of us on the left have been saying, in a way, thank God people like Trump don't really have an industrial policy because, I mean, the Nazis had a version of an industrial policy, and they were able to, in their, of course, demented way, start addressing the problem of unemployment. So it's a really big problem. If the left can't start tackling these issues, then, I mean, who knows who might be in, in a worse way. Look, uh, the right has absolutely no problem directly employing the unemployed if that serves the purpose. I think that, like, you know, just like the issue with the budget, right? Despite all the pretense of, you know, fiscal responsibility, the, the right has absolutely no problem um, neglecting all the rules, the pay go rules, and running as high deficit as necessary. And I think. You know, we, we, we need to stop dilly-dallying because, you know, the, the left and the progressives are coming up with a whole lot of policies and they're good policies, you know, better automatic stabilizers, let's strengthen unemployment insurance, let's do this and that. Great. But, you, you know, they all rely on unemployment as a stabilizer. Unless you have the job guarantee, you need to justify why this package uh, relies still on the existence of unemployment as a perennial feature of, of our economy. And I think, you know, I think that the, the progressive left needs to kind of push really much bolder rather than strengthen these old, I, old even if they were a little more progressive uh, policy ideas from uh, the immediate post-war era. Yeah, great point. And I, I've been saying a lot lately, I mean, there's a reason FDR was our most popular president and kept getting reelected. I mean, it was, there was a bold answer for a time that demanded, you know, really bold policies and really now really is that time. Um, and I just want to go back just for a second to UBI and just one point I wanted to make and get your thoughts on this also. And sorry if you, you may have kind of already addressed this when I got kicked out. The other thing that concerns me about UBI is I think on the left, we should be worried when billionaires from the tech industry are also pushing this. And I believe people like Milton Friedman have pushed it in the past. So, and if there is going to be a coalition around an issue, if those people are in the coalition, it's not going to look like what we want it to look like. And you'll notice, I mean, they might be for UBI, you'll never see them being for full employment because they know what that means for addressing the power dynamics. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to say on that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I've, I've said that this could be a Trojan horse uh, and that, and the reason why is, you know, the right knows exactly what it's doing with UBI. Um, like Charles Murray, very articulately, very cleanly has said, look, you're going to get your $10,000 grant. You don't need any of the other welfare states. Scrap the welfare state freedom. So, you know, but you see, the welfare state, as, as bad as it is, it's a patchwork of hard fought specific policies to deal with very concrete issues. You know, if I give you $30,000 and I get rid of social security and I get rid of, you know, education subsidies and I get rid of, you know, it's, it's not freedom. This idea that income is freedom is really, I, I think we have to be very, very careful about that. Now, but so we know what the right wants to do. But I am probably more concerned about 
left support for UBI because there is a um, there is a um, sl a subtle consensus with a market ideology there that as long as I get income, then I can self-determine, I can go and the market will provide me with what I need. Well, we know that the market doesn't provide affordable childcare and housing for people who have money today. If we give more people more money, will the market provide all of those things that we, we lack? So there has to be really a deeper theory of production, of markets, of uh, power, of uh, you know property, it's all of that, right? That um, that it it is a very elusive, you know, it's a very alluring solution, but it's I think it's it's a false promise that it can somehow help us out of these difficult problems that require some very specific um, fights. So yes, I agree. Great point. Um, so I think I'm going to do one final question of my own before opening it up to questions from people in the audience in the chat. Um, so I'll end with a question that's probably an unfair question, um, but the Federal Reserve has actually admitted that we might be looking at 10% unemployment in the long term or the medium to long term. And obviously you can't predict the future, but you know, assuming that we're not gonna get a job guarantee anytime soon, sadly, um, what do you think the economic picture is going to look like in the medium, you know, in the next year or two? You know, we've had, even before the pandemic, um, economists were actually signaling, signaling there are some problems in the economy. And, um, you know, the Trump campaign team right now is saying once we get past COVID, the economy is going to be coming, roaring back. It's going to be great. What do you kind of predict in the next year or two? Okay. You know, I used to be a forecaster in the 90s. I've left the forecasting days behind me. But um, there, there are a couple of ways this can go. One would be, um, you know, throwing, you know, everything at the wall from the conventional toolkit, more loans, you know, more tax cuts, more subsidies, contract here, contract there. It's going to be, you know, pouring water in a very leaky bucket. And it's not going to kickstart the economy in a substantive way. It might do some, you know, it might produce some recovery, a little bit of growth, jobless growth. So if it took us, you know, 11 years to recover from the unemployment rates after the great financial crisis, you know, to bring unemployment down to pre-crisis levels, like how long is it going to take now? I think it's going to be a very long time. And that will create an enormous amount of pain and suffering and more precarious employment conditions for the few that have their jobs, more Uberization. And so it's just going to get worse, more inequality, no doubt. Uh, now, I think because the idea of direct employment is being mainstreamed quickly, I think that whoever is in office is probably going to do something like that, some infrastructure projects. Um, it's not quite clear how big, how bold, how, um, and what kind, right? Uh, you know, you know we, we can have a lot more drilling and we could have a lot more extraction. And as I said, you know, border walls, or we could, you know, try to do some, you know, fire prevention, some, you know, deal with floods in the Midwest, deal, do some green work, all of that. Now, um, what I probably worry about the most is the Nairu coming back with a vengeance. That what, whichever way we go about this, we're still going to have high unemployment rates. And, you know, they might come down faster uh, than, you know, than, you know, expected, but they will not go down to 3.5%, which to me, even that is unacceptable, right? Um, and so then you're going to hear the conversations in the conference halls of economists and in the halls of the Fed of the Nairu being permanently elevated. Even though the Nairu was kind of, you know, as I was saying, you know, the Fed was begrudgingly giving up the Nairu um, and the natural unemployed rate, natural unemployment rate back in February, I think that that can come back and say, well, listen, it's just structural unemployment. There's not much we could do about this. And, and that is, you know, my biggest hope, at least with this book, is just, just to reject that idea that there is really nothing we could, we could do about it. So uh, I, <laughs> I don't have much uh, by way of optimism to offer, except to say that so many people have, have expressed interest in this idea. And 
And whatever change happens doesn't really come from the top, right? It, it happens from people who write novels about it, people who talk about it through arts, people who talk about it in forums like this. It's through the culture creators. We're talking about culture. You know, there is also sort of a positive culture creation process that, that happens um, outside the, you know, the, the field of economics. So I'm, I'm hoping that that happens quickly so that we, there can be more pressure exerted um, on, on policymakers, but, uh, you know, the, the, the goal, I, I don't think we should shy away and we should be satisfied with some jobs projects. I think, you know, we, we have to finish some unfinished business. Economic rights need to be part of the way we articulate a vision, uh, going forward. It cannot be just another bandaid. Yeah. And I think one point of optimism for me, this happening right after the Sanders campaign, I think the good thing is that he really, I think, elevated people's standards of what the federal government can do. And I think you've, you know, even Medicare for all, since he's dropped out of the race in COVID, support has just gone even further because people are kind of seeing in real time what happens when you tie healthcare to employment. So I think, you know, I think I agree with you for the long term, these ideas really have a basis to gain more and more traction. Um, yeah, I yeah, mean, the, the FDR revolution happened in two years, but it took about two decades of organizing right. and activism and coalition building. Yeah, well said. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to go now to some questions in the chat. Again, keep putting them in. I'm going to, we may not have a chance to get to every single one, but I'm going to try to get to as many as possible. Um, so one from Carissa, um, and this is, you know, this has come out, come up a lot actually during Bernie Sanders' run twice, and I think in the current climate, it's coming up again. So there's been an argument against universal programs as people look at the New Deal and say, you know, it discriminated against African-Americans. It did not provide the benefits equally. It did not fully address disparity. Um, so, and they kind of implying that contemporary universal programs would do the same thing. They don't really get at disparities, whether it's by race or by gender or, or whatever it, it may be. Um, so can you kind of speak to this concern and explain why a federal universal program like a job guarantee would be the best way to address the specific needs of different demographics and communities? Okay, I mean, <clears throat> so the, the New Deal definitely had problems, but I, I think even that we have to look with a more critical eye that not all uh, jobs projects discriminated, some did, and housing policy was segregated. So there, there were definite problems, but, um, but the New Deal also did uh, quite a bit for um, the black community, for farmers, impoverished farmers, uh, you know, for women, etc. cetera. So, so, but it, it speaks to the fact that when programs are not universal, we still are playing the game of musical chair. Who's deserving? Who should get a job? You know, let them demonstrate. And if they're universal and they're open to anyone and the way the job guarantee is designed is, is to, to fit the job to the person. You know, the, the private sector finds criteria to see whether you fit the job in the private sector. But this is a guarantee. We are also trying to enhance the public, uh, public good. And so if you have something to offer that might not have commercial return, then we will accommodate that. You know, I mean, just so many examples, um, uh, because when you don't do it for, you know, for, for, for return, you, you, can, you can organize your projects in a different way. So I think in that sense, um, guarantees are important. I, the other thing is, again, to draw examples to other programs, you know, like social security. Uh, you know, it's, it's not an ideal design, right? But you're, you're guaranteed retirement, whoever you are. Um, maybe Medicare for all is a better example, or education is a better example, right? That everybody gets to have a seat uh, in a classroom. And that's not going to get rid of, uh, you know, racism and all the other stuff. But at least we start from a premise that everyone has that right. So I think... Yeah, maybe there was another aspect of your question, but I... No, I think that really got it. And one thing I've been obsessively talking about lately is, you know, there was kind of a consensus among figures like Martin Luther King Jr., A. Philip Randolph, Baird Rustin, 
even more so than anti-discrimination legislation, they were pushing for full employment. And they realized, you know, their speeches of Martin Luther King talking to unions as far back as the 50s and saying, you know, automation is going to be a really big problem, especially for black workers. So I hope people can make these connections that full employment is really a huge uh, civil rights issue. Yeah. That's right. Economic insecurity and unemployment is a powerful tool of racial subjugation and also discrimination. You know, so so I think that that was that was the clear message, you know, from Martin Luther King and and um, Coretta Scott King, who you know specifically took on this this fight, the job guarantee fight after his death. Good. Um, so one question, you know, so sometimes cynically conservatives will. Uh, accuse like job guarantee as being make work. You know, we're just making up jobs that aren't relevant. Um, but I think there's a kernel of truth there. You know, we don't want just like coming up with stuff, pulling it out of a hat for people to do. So, you know, I think you have touched on a little bit, like clearly environmental problems are very relevant, but how do we make sure the jobs we are producing are very relevant and not just seem like they're made up on? Okay. so. There are two things we want to talk about this. First, um, uh, make work is, uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit also a red herring. Of course, it's a job like any other. You know, if, if, if somebody doesn't show up for work, you know, they don't get to keep the job. They don't get to keep the paycheck. But what is, what is, um, how do we determine what's make work? If we have elderly companionship, right? Somebody can easily tell you, well, that's just make work. You know, they're just lazy folks that are just pretending to be holding somebody's hand, right? But does it mean that we don't need elder care? Like, do we not have a problem with isolation in, in uh, nursing homes? Of course we do. And so, like any other thing, of course, we want to make sure that, you know, these are useful, useful jobs. And, you know, I think procurement is one way of doing it. You know, the, the community, the self-organization mechanism, um, you know, the, the proverbial example of digging a hole and, you know, painting rocks. I don't, I don't really know what that is. Like, you know, it's just such a hypothetical, right? right. Um, so, but, you know, I, I what, what worries me more is when people say, that um, the arts are not productive because they are not productive in the narrow economic sense, right? But we understand that they're extremely, you know, that, it, you know, so much of what our life, you know, makes our life good is, is the kind of work that has to be done. It's care work. And that is a big philosophical question because care work is the majority of work that we do. We clothe ourselves, we entertain ourselves, we feed ourselves, we protect ourselves, it's care. And we have somehow figured out, you know, to, to do a lot of this stuff through the market mechanism, but so much of it is not uh, done, environmental work, you know, you know, child care and all of that. So definitely it requires, you know, some rebalancing of how we understand work, the importance of work, the you know, what is meaningful work. And, um, the other thing that I want to say is that, um, you know, what's make work? I mean, being unemployed is make work, right? You know, sending applications to get unemployment insurance, you know, uh, applying for jobs that are not there. That's make work. Yep. Well put. And I got to take my cheap shot here, but some people I know who are so-called consultants, it really sounds like if there's anything that's make work these consultants are, that's a good description of it. Um, yeah, plenty of make work in the private sector. Yeah, this is the, this is the gray bear, you know, the, you know, bullshit jobs. Sure, yes, right. yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so another one here, you know, so clearly from the left, we're not all about like labor discipline. We don't want to be laying off people, but it's a good question of, could you be laid off from the federal job? You know, if you just don't show up, don't do anything. I guess, what would be the minimum level of labor discipline insured? Um, how would we navigate that? You know, what would be the process if you are laid off from a federal job? I mean, obviously this is a socially created, you know, the answer is, you know, will depend on, on the workplace and, and, and on the community, but there are basic principles to me that are obvious, right? If you harass people, if you hurt them, if you endanger them, of course you're gonna lose your job, 
right? Um, if you don't show up, you, you haven't done anything. It, it is community work, right? It, it might not be for sale, but still it's something that's valuable. You don't show up, you don't collect a paycheck. So I think that those are straightforward parameters. Um, the way I think of the job guarantee is um, a little bit like public libraries. You know, you, you know the, it's a guarantee. You can always walk into a library, right? Uh, if you are ripping up books and, you know, being, you know, uh, you know disruptive, uh, then you're escorted out, right? Do you lose your privilege to walk into a library again? No, you don't, you know, and, and maybe, maybe there are issues, you know, maybe you have, uh, you know, difficulties holding on to it. You want a job, but you have issues that you, prevent you. Maybe it's lack of transportation. Maybe it's lack of childcare. Maybe it's substance abuse. Again, the job guarantee is not a panacea, but it is situated within a broader kind of set of concerns. And, you know, the idea is because the job guarantee addresses the public good, you know, maybe some of these, you know, programs that prevent people from holding on to a job can be put in place through the job guarantee um, uh, to, to help them be successful. But, you know, uh, you know, what's considered now good work that I think will be socially constructed, right? And, um, uh, and, and because it's not for commercial return, there will be other criteria for, for success, you know, like, you know, have we actually cleaned up the toxic site, right? Have we actually, you know, fixed, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, planted the trees that we said we will plant, right? Right. Um, let me go to one here. So about higher education. Um, so many people pursue higher education as a means of achieving a livable guaranteed job. So with a job guarantee, what impact do you foresee it having on higher ed institutions, um, students and their debt, if any? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, again, a lot of people go to school obviously for the you know for the for the need you know for the for, for the promise of a job but also some of these uh, loan programs have been a kind of unemployment insurance if you notice the explosion in student loans that happened during 2008 a lot of it happened through go back to school right during the crisis and there's it's a complicated there are a lot more reasons why you know the you know loans uh, shot through the roof but um, you don't want education to be an unemployment insurance policy if the jobs again are not there. And so you also don't want again to make these decisions under duress, right? You want to go to school when you can and you want to, when it's time in the field that you think you wish, right, to, to work in. And, you know, we can certainly, because the job community has a, has a training component, you know, you could see very easily how you can combine employment with apprenticeship, with some more vocational training, with, with various credentialing programs and enhancements to help people transition to other employment opportunities. So, so it, it's really that transition critical piece that, you know, if you're going to be educated, at a minimum, you're going to have a stepping stone. And, you know, then you can move on. Yeah. And I'll say, you know, as a teacher, I don't teach in higher ed, but with high school, it is frustration, frustrating this idea that, you know, education is going to solve the economic crisis, you know, and, it, and it's sad because, I mean, I teach in North Philly, some of the poorest zip codes in the country, and, you know, parents and students just have this idea that, well, you got to go to school and that's going to get you the job. And I, you know, I as a teacher cannot overcome the structural un unemployment, you know, um, so it's kind of a faulty logic to think that just by getting education, that's going to guarantee you the job. And I think it fuels people, you know, if you do get an education and you don't get that job, then it's like blame is on you instead of the fact that, again, it's a natural rate of unemployment that's kind of baked into the system. Yeah. And I, this is, you know, really important work by Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton that, you know, especially for African Americans, um, higher education does not translate into higher income. So they don't reap the educational return. So it's, uh, you know, I think that um, the, the economic model very much relies on get trained, you know, get the right kind of training, you know, it was coding, now it's coding, right, before it was something else. And uh, again, it, unless we solve the musical chair program problem, we will never, you will never be able to train people precisely for the jobs that are there, 
Training takes a long time. And, and the best returns to education come from 20 years of education. They don't come from two, right? They come from early education to, you know, primary. So, so that is the kind of investment we are looking for, a long-term investment. But the vagaries of the market, you know, uh, you know, having coding skills this time, and then we're going to have some other robotics next year, and then it's going to be something else. This you can never quite accommodate perfectly. And the way it's accommodated is by firm getting you and training you on the job. That's their responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the person to train themselves to fit the, that job. Yep. And if I had a dollar for every principal I've heard talk about coding, I would, <laughs> I would not even need, need a job. Um, so one interesting question here, and I think this gets at a broader philosophical debate. And again, you may have addressed it a little bit in UBI, so I'm sorry if I missed that part. But, you know, traditionally in the 20th century, the left, um, in a way, was kind of glorified work and the worker. Um, with UBI, part of the idea is this, you know, if we can get UBI, like we won't have to do bullshit jobs. We won't have to do jobs we don't like. There'll be so much more leisure time. Um, so where do you kind of fall on this? Do you think the left glorifies work too much? Do you think we um, are going too far to the side of not glorifying work? Um, kind of where, where do you fall on this question? To me, like work is like one of those things that are like breathing. You know, I, I think what people have trouble with is how paid work is structured, right? That's the difficulty, but, but the way I see uh, the system, any system, is that it takes work. Everything takes work. And it's how that work is structured. In this particular you know, uh, system, we have paid work that is precarious and undemocratic. Okay? And so job, the job guarantee is just one piece of, of reform that attempts to democratize work and empower us uh, in, in uh, working places and give us more tools uh, for self-determination, et cetera. And that, you know, we, we need to think, do things. And as I was saying a moment ago, a lot of those things are care things, you know, it's care work. And so I don't believe that there is a spontaneous mechanism where we all, if we got basic income, we are all going to suddenly band together and provide the health care we need. I, I, I don't believe in that kind of organization. I think that, you know, we, you know, we, um, income alone is not, you know, what, what is, what is required. And so, um, you know, I think that there is some work fetishism. I'm not sure if it comes from the, from the left. I think it comes from the corporate sector, right? That, you know, you just have to jump as high as you're, as you're told. And we, we also know that people are better workers when they have provided with better working conditions in the private sector as well, right? Just creating difficult circumstances doesn't make people more productive, doesn't make them better workers. So, so even within, within the market economy, the, the way we do things is upside down. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, this pandemic and the quarantine has revealed something else. And, you know, this is kind of anecdotal, but I have a sense that one thing people have discovered is that we actually don't like sitting around the house all day. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm all for more leisure time, but I do think most people want to be doing something productive. And again, I don't mean productive making profits for Jeff Bezos, but, and, you know, people want to be connected to people at work. They want to be doing something they feel is useful. They don't want to sit on the couch all day. And I think you're right to point out what it's, it's more about making those good jobs, you know, and I think people can, everyone has stories of how one job was much better than the other, you know, for different reasons. Yeah, and actually, I, I want to point, point this out. It was a really good point that you brought up the reduced working week, because um, that's a battle that's long overdue, right? So we can win that battle. Like in the book, I point out that, you know, when we passed the 40 hour working week, the 30 hour working week was very popular and it was narrowly defeated. So even back then, you know, we, we could have had a 30 hour working week. Some countries are making progress on that front. But once again, it's, you know, it's all great, but you're not going to get your 30 hour working week if there is unemployment lo looming over you. But if you use the job guarantees to set the labor standard and say full pay benefits for 30 hour working week, then that redefines the labor standard. And I think we can most definitely all use more leisure. And in this context, also technology is not necessarily the enemy. 
right? Because we jobs are constantly pitted against technology, and I think we're thinking about it completely the wrong way. You know, we should automate some jobs. Some jo bad jobs need to disappear altogether, and we can still be doing work together with contact and doing the sorts of things that we value. Um, so, uh, kind of a similar question from Warren Davis. He asks, basically, how do we start? Who ends up doing the quote unquote worst job? So, stuff like sanitation work, jobs that are dirty and dangerous. You know, do we pay more for these worst jobs? Um, do we automate these jobs? How do we kind of destratify the work environment? If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, okay, you absolutely we should pay hazard pay. You know, there should be hazard pay. Every job should have, you know, guaranteed paid leave, all of that. Absolutely. Like, if, whatever your job is should allow you to live on it. And if it's dangerous, you need all the protections, etc. Now, what are, what is the, what are the worst jobs? The worst jobs are the ones that are dangerous and underpaid, right? Like you've heard all these anecdotal stories of people in COVID, you know, I'm a grocery store clerk and finally I feel I'm important because I'm here on the job while everybody is at home and I have to feed them. So even, I think that shatters our views of what's a dangerous, sanitation is essential, right? <laughs> Especially in COVID, but they're considered to be bad jobs, terrible jobs. And the reason is because we just treat people very poorly in those jobs. Um, so I think I'm going to do one more question for the audience and I'm going to end with one more on my own. Um, so I have one from Katie about um, basically how do we counter this argument, the efficiency argument about the private sector? You know, they're more efficient, public sector isn't. If we turn our economy over to the federal sector, it's going to be a disaster. What are maybe some good talking points against this? So several things um, to point out, if the private sector was so, so efficient, you know, why do we have pollution and why do we have, uh, you know, terrible water systems, you know, for, for cities that are managed by private companies, right? So you can, you can provide examples. You know, you, there are certain things that cannot be provided for commercial return because you need redundancy. There are some aspects of life that you cannot have the lowest cost production model for those. When you fly an aircraft, you want redundancy. You don't want the cheapest aircraft and the most lean production. You want to have multiple systems to protect you. And so that's how you want to think about other things like water, like air quality, like care for children. You don't want the lowest cost you know, worker that's underpaid and uh, you know, hasn't slept and has commuted three hours to take care of your kid, right? You want them well taken care of. So, you know, that's one way to do this. Of course, we are not talking about work that is, you know, card production and, you know, consumer goods. You know, we are talking about the sorts of things that the private sector does not have the incentive to do that are still critical for our basic well-being. So I think that's one way to, to do it. And then hopefully that will chip away at this idea of very narrowly uh, defining productive work as one that is profitable. Uh, it out, but um, I think I mean, you've convinced me. I think um, people are convinced. You know, going my internet might be going a little crazy again. But so going forward, um, what is the best way? What is the best uh, way? Political reality. What was a good next step? Uh, I mean, I so one. I think my hope, at least, is that in our conversation about jobs, we don't settle on jobs programs. That we push for the vision of a guarantee as a as a basic right. Uh, as a legally codified right, um, legally enforceable right. And so, you know, in, in our, I think, you know, we are, we are moving through this transformation of rehabilitating the public sector as well, right? Uh, you know, hopefully the pendulum is swinging a little bit from the Reagan revolution and we are not, it hasn't swung, you know, it's a bit of a slow process. But as we uh, rehabilitate the role of the public sector and, it's, uh, and, and what it's supposed to do, I think that, you know, sort of an unrelenting commitment to guaranteeing those rights, you know, insisting that they have not been secured and this one particular one is, is missing. Um, um, I mean, the other thing is, 
that, um, you know, um, coalition building has been very important. You know, you know, I have, you know, I've worked with Job Guarantee Coalition, but um, our work is inherently connected to the housing guarantee work. It's inherently connected to food uh, insecurity movements, to uh, um, folks who deal with people with disabilities. And so the, the more we kind of make these, these connections and we articulate um, how this is really the same fight, I think you know, the, the more success or chance we have to, uh, to provide a new, a new vision. I, I, what I would just hate to miss is this teachable moment, obviously. 2008 was a teachable moment. This is a teachable, it's gonna be even more pressing. And that we, we don't concede to um, well-meaning, but kind of inadequate, you know, kind of uh, policies from the old, you know, from the old, uh, progressive era that we need to re-envision what, what the next progressive era is very well said and i hope they start bringing you on like cnn and msnbc more because we or even fox news uh we really because we really need to get this out to a mainstream audience because like the poll said i i guarantee if you're a republican just like republicans wouldn't like us taking away social security i guarantee you they can um identify with wanting good quality jobs um so Paulina, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this was a really great discussion. And I, I think we're gonna be talking about this idea um, for a long time to come.